Information Security Manager Prep Webinar. I am Dr. Christopher V. Feudo, President, University of Fairfax, the 100% online graduate focused cybersecurity institution across the nation, awarding master's and doctoral degrees in cybersecurity as well as critical cybersecurity certifications. I want to thank you for joining us today and reiterate that we are here to help you to secure your future. Today's clinic covers the four SISM domains to provide you with helpful practical test taken tips and hints to help you to quickly assess, delay, eliminate how to answer questions. You also receive takeaways as an additional hints and tips to better prepare you to take the uh, SISM exam and be able to pass. Today's speaker is Dr. Dustin Loeffler, who has a top secret SCI security clearance with counterintelligence polygraph and a slew of critical certifications to include CISSP, CEH, CISA, CISM, CCMP, CCA, and various comp TIA certs, as well as the Microsoft Certified Solution Architect. Dustin is currently an information security consultant with the United States government providing subject matter expertise analysis for incident handling and response as well as conducting malware analysis attack vectors and APT sources. He is also providing expert testimony on patent infringement and forensic analysis cases. Dustin is an adjunct professor at a number of universities to include, of course, the University of Fairfax. He is the author of an iBook series newsletter and serves currently as well as president and software engineer at BHI LLC in the greater St. Louis area, engineering and architect in smartphone application development. Previously, he served as a consultant with Spare Tips Inc conducted fusion cell analysis for the evaluation of open source intelligence to determine interrelationships, trends, and relevancy to current threats for corporate councils and chief executives. Prior to that, he was the chief system security engineer at Boeing and was the ethical hacker slash systems manager with IBM Global Services. Dustin has earned his degrees from the University of Missouri at Rolla. Now, since he's got some time on his hands, he is actively pursuing certified public accounting license. Before we move forward, I'd like to put in a brief word on behalf of the University of Fairfax, the sponsor of this webinar. University of Fairfax is the nation's foremost graduate level cybersecurity institution where cybersecurity is our only focus. Our cybersecurity education path provides opportunities for IT professionals to gain the cybersecurity credentials from graduate certificates through master's and doctoral degrees to support every level of your career. Without further ado, I present Dr. Dustin Luffler. Dustin? All right. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, appreciate you, your introduction, and uh, appreciate University of Fairfax for having me on today. So um, just wanted to put a quick plug out there. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to use the uh, Twitter handle, uh, hashtag CybersecurityLive. Um, I'll be responding to, I'll be checking the Twitter feed and responding to questions uh, right after the, the end of the brief. So kind of got a target of about somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, depends how many questions we take on the briefing. So um, without further ado, I just thought the best place to start is to kind of tell you a little bit about my journey to the CISM certification. So I, as I assume that most of you are, are, you know, attending this webinar thinking that you'd like to go forward with uh, uh, pursuing this certification. So I think it, it, it's best just to kind of baseline everybody tell you where I came from, the, the factors I looked at um, before pursuing this, this certification. So as uh, Chris mentioned, I, I already had several technical certs already amongst like the CISSP, CEH, things like that. And I think those certifications, uh, and also CISA, which is also offered by um, ISOC as well, it's kind of a partner certification uh, to the CISM. 
but I was really looking for that position to go from, if I could use a military term, from a uh, kind of the enlisted technician aspect to where I'm you know, doing to more of an officer outlook. So uh, I, I was really looking to become that officer per se in the military. I was looking to climb the ladder and uh, look at more not only the technical day-to-day, -day, but more the strategic planning that, that is needed in security. So what I did is um, I looked at some, I found some job requisitions, and I would invite you to do the same. Find some job requisitions, not for the job you currently have, or maybe for the job you currently have, but really for the job that you want. Uh, and, and what I did is I found some higher level information security management positions and uh, really did a, a good breakdown of all the different requirements that were in those job postings. And then I looked at my resume and really did a good gap analysis on the skills um, that I already thought I had and then those additional skills that I thought I needed to make that jump to the next level. And what I realized in conducting, the, in that, gap, in conducting that gap analysis is that I needed more picture, a more big picture exposure. I needed to think more strategic instead of um, tactical, if you will. And I, I, as Chris mentioned, I was working for Boeing, so I really wanted. Um, uh, it was really incumbent upon me to have some kind of plug-in into the DoD 8570 framework, and I'll cover a little bit about what that reg is in a little bit, but. Um, it's a, it's a certification expectation, I would say, that comes down from the Department of Defense for all DOD contractors. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I, whatever effort I put in would also, you know, have some tangential benefits as well. So that's when I started looking at the, the CISM certification. Another thing that was important to me is that I wanted a certification that was universally accepted. I didn't want it to be um, siloed, if you will, into a specific industry, you know, small industry or specific um, area per se, or specific job code. I wanted that uh, those things that you see in job recs <laughs> because of their applicability in numerous areas, but I also wanted um, a certification that had um, uh, a lot of recognition, not only domestically in the United States, but also a certification that had international recognition. And to me, the CISM were met all of those requirements. And you'll see people with, uh, you know, a certification here, a certification there, but this, this cert does a great job, uh, I call it the fusion with other certs, in um, taking you not only from the information security area, as most people think about it, uh, you know, doing information security, um, hard name, uh, vulnerability analysis, things like that. But it also bridges a very important gap into the IT auditing world, which is just exploding right now. I don't know if anyone watching currently is in the IT audit function, but uh, again, it's it's usually it's a function that's owned, let's say, by auditing firms that already have current contracts with uh, with companies. So uh, you're able to supplement those current auditing services with IT auditing services uh, for businesses who have their internal or external auditing firm. The big four all have big four accounting firms, um, such as Deloitte and Ernst and Young, all have IT auditing auditing practices to supplement their traditional auditing offerings now. So uh, the this CISM certification kind of bridges the gap from those people who are doing information security and you're able to translate those information security skills into that area of uh, IT audit. So we've got uh, this, this organization who, who manages these certifications and you'll hear me refer to ISACA. So it's important for me just to kind of give you a brief little history on ISACA. It was originally founded in 1969, so that's important because it shows that it has history. Um, and it's not a certification that has just popped up. It's something that's, uh, or an organization that just popped up. It's been around a long time, and they originally came out as uh, EDP Auditors Association. 
Since then, they've changed their name to Information Systems Audit and Control Association, or ASACA. And they're based in Rolling Meadows, Illinois, which is near Chicago. They've got 110,000 members in 180 countries. So it's, it's it, once you join ISACA or become part of ISACA, it is a very, very strong network of people that you can ask uh, questions. I, LinkedIn is a fantastic avenue to ask those questions because there are ISACA groups. Um, so you can ask questions, you can find job leads, um, uh, jobs are posted on those LinkedIn pages that are really catered to people with the CISM certification, so it really helps with that filtering process. Uh, I, I strongly recommend uh, people join or at least participate with in ISACA, maybe chapter events, things like that. So there are 200 chapters worldwide. Um, Pretty much every city has one, major city has one, um, and those are I, the chapter I belong to. We have um, six networking events over the course of a year. A uh, great place to meet people from other country, uh, other other companies, um, share lessons learned, and get uh, get timely uh, continuing education in certain risk areas. Also, kind of going back to the importance of the international recognition, for me, uh, ISACA is ANSI accredited. And that means that it, it gets interna that international recognition. So uh, if you have an ANSI, ANSI accredited program, it, it, it shows that the that rigors there for the exam and that the uh, material is on point and is applicable to what's really going on in the industry. So that was really important to me as well. Now, to supplement the discussion about uh, DOD 8570, uh, again, uh, just to reiterate, it's a directive that came out from the Department of Defense. I think it was back in 2005, I want to say. Um, and that was really a directive saying, hey, hey uh, we want a level of technical competence for every employee who has a pri has privilege access to a DOD system, and they turn to certifications as the avenue to to measure that technical competence. And I think it was a great move because it really baselines everyone who has that privilege access. Because if you have privilege access to a system, you're automatically a uh, could be a target or a potential threat. So it, any full part-time military member, plus contractor, or local, nat, local nationals have to have a certification, either an IAT or an IAM certification, depending on the role of their specific company. And, tech, and usually it's uh, contractually mandated. So this applies to you, and it applied to me, because uh, the, the role I was in was an IAM level two so there was that expect, I was moving from an uh, IAT level to an IAM level, and a uh, CISM was, it was one of those certifications that the DOD recognized to fill, uh, fulfill those uh, contractual requirements. So who should take the CISM? CISM? I get this question a lot. And really, um, so there's the CISA certification, the Certified Information Security Auditor. Uh, that is more the kind of think that enlisted example, I guess, is the, the best way to put it. The, the ones who are actually doing those tactile functions on a system, who are conducting the audits, per se. Then you have those who are a more appropriate audience for the CISM. And it's really those people in management functions or director level functions. A lot of the job titles you'll see with people who hold the CISM certification are security managers, directors, officers, or security consultants. The great thing about this certification is it actually enables lateral movement. And by that, I mean that a security consultant uh, but let's say an example of a security consultant can move laterally between different industries 
because of the recognition of the CISM. So they can, for instance, they can, um, uh, they've been doing strategic planning for uh, in the healthcare industry from a security perspective. Well, with this with this certification, it's it has taught you the, you know, real fundamentals of what it means to be a good security manager, and it able can enable you to move more easily into an industry, let's say, like, I don't know, like um, um, defense, for instance. So, uh, again, it's the same kind of uh, principles and the same uh, basic objectives are taught on this certification that can be reinforced in, in various industries. So what makes it unique? Um, it's really... It's a certification that is designed for IS security managers. I uh, have a lot of CISOs, for instance, who have this certification. A lot of um, C, uh, CIOs and CISOs and uh, uh, security directors, those kind of people are typically the ones, uh, first level management as well, uh, typically are the ones who are going to go after the CISM or those people who are currently in a technical capacity who are looking to grow into a management role. Again, I would recommend that as well. The great thing about this cert as well is that it's developed by those people who are in the industry, and actually those questions are validated by people in the industry. I've helped um, with one of the reasons why I can't really talk about you know, exact questions per se, of course, the you know, integrity of the exam, but um, I've done some question review for the organization, so I don't, um, I, I've seen potential questions that may end up on the exam, and I, I can tell you there's a great vetting process that these questions go through prior to ending up on the CISM, CISM exam. There's been, in addition to that, there's been exponential growth in the number of CISMs out there. Currently there's 16,000 uh, exams offered in 250 locations. You'll see this in virtually every city where there's a chapter. There will also be a, an exam offered as well. Uh, and it's, it's really gone in multiple languages. Uh, well, it, to me, it's truly a global certification. So criteria for the exam, uh, you have to earn a passing score, which I'll talk about in a little bit. You should have five years of information security work experience prior to taking the exam. Um, also have you know so, some people who maybe have four years of information security experience and they've been able to go ahead and sit for the exam but they're not given the certification until they actually, uh, if they pass the certification exam, they won't get that uh, certification until they actually uh, complete their fifth year of IS security experience. So. Um, so if you don't have those five years yet, don't don't be completely discouraged. So. Also, there's um, you have to attest to the ASACA Code of Ethics, which is pretty pretty much to sum it up is kind of the do no harm approach, and um, they do have a continuing education policy to keep your certification current. Not too different than what you'll see on like the CISSP, for instance. Again, uh, Department of Defense recognizes this for the IAT category at both the level two and level three areas. And uh, the VA reimburses the exam fee for the CISS, CISS, CISM exam, pardon me. I've also seen uh, the VA pick up the cost of boot camps as well for this certification. Specifically, if those um, boot camps are um, you know college credit bearing, for instance, and Microsoft has recognized the CISM as well in its uh, security management specialization. So it'll actually get you out of having to take one, if not two, uh, parts of uh, Microsoft certification. By title, uh, you can kind of see that there's a really good mix of people that you see with this certification. Um, Predominantly, it's security professionals, um, and I think it's mostly those security professionals because they're trying to move into that uh, top 
top area there, that IT director, manager, consultant kind of area. Uh, it's one of the proverbial boxes that you have to check prior to moving to the next level. All right, this is a little new since 2012-2013, uh, previous, um, previous to that time, the CISM was actually five different domains. They've actually combined uh, domain three, uh, which was program development, and then there was a separate domain, information security program management. So that's been combined into one domain. As you can see, the four domains are listed, IS security governance, information risk management, information security program development and management, and information security incident management. Now, you can see a, an allocation of questions across those domains. So, it doesn't take a rocket science scientist to figure out that really domain two is going to be where, the, where you want to spend you know, more time than let's say domain four in your focus study in your self-study or, or boot camp study. The exam itself is 200 questions long. You have 400, or pardon me, four hours to complete. And they're questions that are really designed to test both practical knowledge and the experience that you've had. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. All questions are multiple choice. Uh, there's four answers, uh, four possible answers per question. And the questions ask you to choose the best answer. Uh, this, this exam is not offered in a CBT format or a computer-based format. It's what you see in the corner, that old Scantron format. So on test day, make sure you have you know, the uh, number two pencils ready to go and uh, because you'll be filling out a uh, uh, Scantron. 200 questions can try out of a, uh, with a corresponding test booklet. Again, there's uh, roughly 250 sites where this is offered. Uh, again, it's offered everywhere a chapter is located. Now, the one thing that is really kind of confusing is the grading scale in which uh, ISACO uses. So, they use a 200 to 800 point scale, and 450 is what you need to pass the exam. So, but the important thing to note is it's not based on a percentage average. So you don't take, for instance, 450 over 800 or 600 or anything like that. What you want to kind of do is <laughs> try to do the math, and it kind of works out if you're getting between six and seven questions out of ten right, uh, you're doing a good job and will pass the exam. That's kind of what I've seen in, uh, in my practice, practice, practice exams. For 2014, we have all the exams are on Saturdays. It's only offered three times a year, uh, which is up from two, uh, what they previously had. Uh, so the next one coming up is the 14th of June. Uh, there's a registration final registration for that exam on the 11th. Sometimes they'll give you an extra day or two um, wiggle room on that, but I would register as soon as possible if you're interested in take, again, taking the exam. Uh, there's another date of 6 September and 13 December. So just wanted to put those dates out there so you can kind of, if, if you're interested in registering for the exam, it gives you a good timeline in which to do that. Uh, maybe set a reminder on the calendar what have you. Um, plus, it's important to note that the registration deadline is pretty far in advance of when the actual exam is, and that's because it is a paper-based exam. So they've got, you know, ISACA's got logistics to take care of. For instance, um, you know, they have to take care of uh, distributing the right number of test booklets, scantrons, uh, getting testing centers figured out, you know, uh, registration for those testing centers that are large enough that they need larger classrooms, smaller classrooms, you know, what have you. So it takes a lot of time to do that. That's really why the registration um, deadline is, is so much, is so in advance of the test date so much. Cost to take the exam uh, for ISACA members, 
there are early registration dates out there on the web, on the ISACA website. Uh, the 420, if you're an ISACA member, 600 bucks. If you're a non-member, for up until the final registration for those test dates, uh, there's a $50 increase for both the ISACA member and non-member. If you're, if you currently are a non-member and want to join ISACA at the same time you're registering for those exams, you can do that, which is something I did. Um, if you're taking any classes. You can register as a student member, which is only $25 a year. And uh, you can see you know, the difference between a non-member and, an, and a member price. It uh, really more than pays for itself. If you're looking to join ISACA as a full-time professional, uh, instead of that student membership, the cost is uh, $130. So it'll cost you a little bit more, but uh, I still think it, it's worth it because you can still get that discount again and it'll pay for itself. At this point I also wanted to remind anyone if there are any questions, um, you can use Twitter. Uh, hashtag cybersecurity live, all one word. And I'll try and address those questions at the end of the brief. So the CISM domains are really divided into task statements and knowledge statements. So a task statement is more kind of a situational, I would say. In implementation, it give, would give you like a hypothetical fact pattern and ask you what you would do. And versus knowledge statements, which are more, I would say, kind of that um, brute force memory exercise. Uh, to me, a knowledge statement versus a task statement is kind of like your bachelor's degree versus your master's degree. Bachelor's degrees are more um, uh, again, that memorization versus those test statements, which are more conceptual in nature. Um, you can see how it breaks down, and I've got the four domains listed, along with the type of statements. And it shows an allocation over 200 questions, how that would break down. Again, as you can see, uh, domain two is go going to be where the bulk of your questions are. And uh, it roughly comes out. Um, Nine questions are task statement related, and 19 are knowledge related within that domain. Uh, with domain one, you can see it's 9, 15 for a total of 48, and so on and so on for domains three and four. Again, domain four, which is the security incident domain, has the least amount of exam questions on the CISM exam. So a little bit about the domain specifically. First one again is information security governance. And the purpose of this is to maintain that framework. Again, we're looking at things from a management standpoint to figure out how we'll, how we'll deal with I, uh, information security strategy and make sure those strategies, let's say we're the CIO or CISO, make sure they align with what the business wants. Uh, because typically, in most companies that you work in, that IT arena is really an overhead function. And uh, you're there to help enable business in some capacity. So this domain will really look at, um, again, strategic alignment. So whatever requirements you have in place, is how is that furthering or being influenced by your organizational objectives. So let's say your organization wants to start doing international business per se. So um, how are we going to uh, take care of secure VP, or, you know, secure connectivity maybe via VPN for those um, sites that we're going to have overseas? And we want to make sure this is really important because I see this a lot and I deal a lot with engineers and engineers are fantastic and uh, great people, but they typically want to over-engineer uh, a product which will, which, you know, I love bells and whistles, but a lot of times they, it takes a uh, manager to make sure that those um, bells and whistles aren't over-engineered and don't, uh, you know, either cost too much or not meet the business goals. Uh, for instance, it might be, I don't know, if you're looking to harden a Windows uh, 7 load. 
So you try and um, you put hardening functions on that OS, and it, it can't, you've hardened it so much that it can't do the job that it needs to do to support the business, let's say, in a manufacturing line environment. Also, you want to make sure that the uh, investments that you're making in security products aligns with the uh, organizational strategy. So a big one right now is when, in light of the target breach, is uh, let's say, you know, everyone, pretty much anyone who does retail now are going to have to adjust their their uh, investment strategy from a security perspective and replacing the card readers that are currently at all of the retail locations to support the EBM cards, for instance. So what is that going to look like? You want to make sure that you understand kind of where your business is going and are able to uh, support that. From a risk management approach, you want to understand what risks are really out there. And then learn about what's called risk mitigation, which are plans that you can put into place to try and reduce the uh, likelihood of that risk impacting operations, for instance. Also, you want uh, value, deliver value delivery, which is you want standard security practices. It's the same thing like with for the law, for instance, you don't want to go into, you know, one county in the state and be subject to a different set of laws than another county in the state. You want that same kind of security, uh, you know, baseline security practices and standards within an organization. And then you can prior you learn how to prioritize certain security objectives or products based on what comes out of your risk management analysis. Also, as far as resources go, resources are not infinite. Uh, that's why we have resource management. So how are we capturing you know, uh, lessons learned, for instance, and applying those lessons learned in future situations that may be similar so that we can uh, take, you know, get some lift off of money that we've already invested, let's say, in those lessons learned. And also, we want to make sure we have a very efficient security architecture. So um, I'm all for defense in depth, but uh, in a, there should be an efficient security infrastructure that supports defense in depth without being overly cost prohibitive or impact organizational operations. Oh, metrics. So um, you probably heard, you know, <laughs> if you're not able to tell the story of how you're doing your business, uh, you're not effectively managing your business. So metrics are really the avenue in which you're able to tell the story of how information security is favorably impacting the organization. You have to have that story put together because it um, it shows that the you know the what's the organization's return on investment for putting so much money in this information security area, which again is typically kind of that overhead area. Uh, I mean, you're really trying to keep the organization's name out of the headlines um, so there's not another, you know, Target or Sally Beauty Supply case, uh, just to pick two that are very, very recent. Also, you want to look at how effective um, your security infrastructure is against what you're seeing in external assessments, like external pen tests, let's say if you fall under PCI compliance um, guidelines on credit card acceptance. And also you want to see how well you integrate with other assurance functions. So other assurance functions think like audit or think um, loss prevention, for instance. So those other organizations that are like the, I don't know, the um, uh, police or watchdogs of that organization. Uh, so you want to see what relationships you have with them and make sure there's no duplicity or overlap in between each of your functions. So it's kind of like an exercise in organizational chart, if you will, and key responsibility areas. On domain two, the uh, information risk management compliance area, you want to make sure that uh, risks are being satisfactorily managed, again, to achieve business objectives. And again, this is 33% of the exam. This is a great place to start your studying. Typically, most 
people are most familiar, I would say, with this domain. Um, some people like to start on domain one just because the domains kind of build upon themselves. One built upon two, which built upon, uh, or pardon me, two built upon one, which, and then three built upon two, and so on. So these are these are great places to kind of kind of focus your studying efforts, if you will, if you have to make that opportunity talk. Now this requires you to have a good understanding of, again, at the high level of your threat, vulnerability, and risk profiles. Um, what are the external and internal threats? what vulnerabilities exist in your infrastructure, and what kind of risk is there that could exploit those vulnerabilities. You also want to understand what, based on that risk exposure that you look at, what are the consequences? Um, you know, a lot of companies put a lot of their money, information security budget, to protect uh, items such as intellectual property. So, and this is an exercise I went through uh, when I was at Boeing. So we, we looked at, you know, eight to ten technologies that we felt were critical technologies, and we put as much information security controls around those as possible. So part of that was looking at, you know, we, we would continually do real-time vulner vulnerability analyses against you know, that the crown jewels, if you will, and what was our risk exposure, especially when dealing with, you know, international clients and uh, things of that nature who might be interested in our intellectual property. As with anything else, budgets are not, you know, endless. Uh, you have to really prioritize uh, where you're going to be putting your money based on the amount of risk out there and what are your risk mitigation strategies in the future. We're not in that complete risk avoidance area any longer, which means that we need to take 100% out, 100% of risk out of everything we do. It's more of a risk mitigation process. So we have, uh, after we've applied uh, mitigation strategies, there's still going to be this thing called residual risk. And it's those things that we cannot mitigate and must accept as the cost of doing business. And also, what is our cost effectiveness of implementing an information security strategy? Are we doing it well? Are we over budget, under budget, or are we making the right decisions? Uh, are trade studies leading us to appropriate product selection? Things of that nature. Then we have the newly combined domain that information security program development and management. This is really the holistic program in which we, we manage. We have to ensure that we have, again, strategic alignment with the organization. We want to ensure that business requirements uh, that come down from our, our business partners help drive initiatives that we're looking at either pursuing or maintaining. We want to enumerate risks and select appropriate controls and put those appropriate controls in place and agree with our business partners on what risk tolerance is appropriate. You'll hear the word controls a lot, and uh, controls are really anything that can be put into place to help uh, mitigate risk. For instance, your username and password is a control, and that control is uh, put into place to prevent uh, unauthorized people from logging in the computer and seeing any local data, for instance. As far as risk management goes, um, it, it really focuses on continuing to manage that risk the elements of risk that are always going to be ongoing and changing in both the external and, and internal environment. How often do you have uh, risk management meetings? Um, what is the content of those meetings? Uh, what happens if we have a new risk that you know creeps up, let's say, as part of a zero-day attack or what have you? Also, we have to have uh, some kind of value delivery. So we want to ensure that we have um, continuous delivery of effective and efficient products that continue to support organizational goals. Again, budgets are not endless, uh, so we have resource management to deal with. We uh, Technology selection is a big part of that, along with 
trying to choose what projects we're going to go after, what projects are going to be kind of in a weight category. Technology selection is one of the tools that I had always used for would, would be the trade study approach. So look at all pieces of technology in a trade study and uh, come up with critical success factors and try and assign a weighting to those critical success factors and then do analysis on each piece of those technology. Plus skill acquisition. Are there skills that you're short of? Can we do cross-training? Um, uh, how do we implement new skills in our employees? Things like that. All Again, all management kind of related functions. Again, where do we integrate with other assurance functions? Uh, again, I mentioned uh, like data loss or audit. And then we have uh, performance management, which is the continued monitoring of, of metrics that are available. I was trying to determine what the effectiveness of those metrics and maybe what metrics we need or maybe don't need any longer. Finally, domain four is security, information security incident management. And this is when uh, guess, you know, the wheels fall off the car. This is what happens when there's a really a crisis situation. And this is probably where I spend the most of my time. It's whenever we have those um, critical incidents that occur, how can we effectively uh, recover from those incidents? Target, prototypical example of domain four. You know, how do you once you find out, once an incident's detected, how do you diagnose that incident effectively? You know, do we have, let's say, um, for instance, uh, signatures in our uh, intrusion prevention systems, for instance, uh, our intrusion detection systems? You know, how are we ensuring that we effectively triage those incidents effectively in the first few minutes based on uh, data that we have available? Based on that diagnosis, it's so important because that shows how we're going to manage those incidents. Um, you know, is it a high category level incident where the CISO must immediately be notified, if, let's say in cases of a data breach, or is it that normal business um, where we can, you know, take care of it via patching, for instance? How are we going to contain and minimize damage? So what? Uh, you know, firewalls can we put in, into place, or can we take some systems offline yet preserving those systems for forensic investigation if there is, in fact, a security incident? How do we get those critical services back as soon as possible? For instance, um, I worked a case once where uh, the payroll server was down and it was a pay week. So we, we really understood that we had to get that payroll server back up as soon as possible so that checks could be cut. Also, we weren't going to have a workforce. Uh, also, uh, any root causes, so there should be an after action investigation on, uh, on incidents to determine what were the root causes and how can we uh, prevent these uh, root causes from further occurrence. So I just wanted to kind of give you some advice of, you know, people I've talked to in my peer study group or um, ad advice that I have on the exam. Really, I think it takes a good two months if you're aggressive, but really a good three months uh, to put a good study plan together, especially if you're working professionals. If you're, you know, if you're not currently working, uh, you can probably do it in 30 to 60 days, but if you, if you do have a job, I, I would recommend a three-month study plan. Attend a boot camp early in your study plan. Uh, that'll help you with, uh, you know, really baselining exactly what you uh, kind of need to know. I think a lot of people make the mistake about doing self-study, then doing a boot camp, you know, maybe the week before um, certification, thinking that, you know, that short-term memory will help carry them across the finish line. I actually recommend that you do the boot camp first, um, and then you supplement that boot camp because it gives you the framework with self-study. And um, if you're disciplined in your self-study, that'll help you understand the, the content that, that's really needed for the certification. Plus, um, if you do that boot camp early, usually it'll tell you certain items to focus on, so you really won't waste your self-study time, for instance. Also, with um, those boot camps, another thing I recommend that's not on here is if uh, you, know, you have other people in your workplace who are um, 
uh, studying for the same certification, it would be helpful to do maybe a uh, once a week brown bag kind of session, talk about you know things you're doing, uh, your study techniques, uh, just to share, share lessons learned with one another. Uh, another thing I recommend is start with domains that you're most familiar with. For me, that was domain two at the time. Um, I kind of jumped around. I went two, then four, then one, then three. Uh, so I would start kind of where you're at, and if you're kind of equally familiar with all of those domains, I would start at domain one, and then just work yourself uh, through domain four chronologically. Again, because they build upon one another. Um, with ISACA, they um, uh, get the statements um, that are listed online. It shows it exactly, uh, it gives you a great roadmap. It's almost like a syllabus, is how I say, <laughs> is, is the comparison I make. And then supplement those uh, statements from outside materials, such as like a CISM prep guide, for instance. Uh, they'll give you a good layout of exactly of where you should be, and then you would uh, supplement that with, uh, you know, textual uh, resources, such as you know, the big, thick prep, prep guides, for instance. Good target that I would strive for would be to get those 7 out of 10, 10 questions right on every practice, press, practice exam, pardon me, and those practice, yeah, having trouble with that word today, practice exam are available on such sites as uh, CCC Secure. So, sorry for the typo there on sites. Also, remember that CISM is a time-constrained test. Uh, whenever you do read the questions, and you'll see what I'm talking about when you take the pra practice exams, you'll really quickly eliminate two of those answers. So you really only have two to focus on. And the key kind of takeaway that I have is go back and look at the question and then look at the answers. If you see the words like most, least, best, primary, lowest, that is a huge footstop. And uh, based on those words can help drive you to the correct answer because they're uh, those words are, you know, exclusionary in some cases, all they're all, or they are all-encompassing. And the best piece of advice that I have is that it's a marathon, not a race. So that is why I really recommend that three-month-ish uh, study cycle to prep you for the exam. So again, uh, any questions, uh, you can please submit them to hashtag CybersecurityLive, uh, or, or please feel free to email me. My email address is there as well. Uh, before I start taking questions, I do kind of want to put a plug in for next month's webcast. Uh, next month, uh, University of Fairfax will be hosting a discussion on the target data breach. And I've touched on it a couple times already, um, but I think this is going to be a, a great discussion that really looks at the um, uh, you know, attack vectors and re subsequent recovery that targets had to go through uh, as part of that uh, data breach. With that, uh, that concludes my presentation, and I will be now monitoring the Twitter feed.